So there's some great homework here you can get it after class if you haven't picked it up already. Uh, <coughs> and uh, we will have a problem session uh, this afternoon after lecture. Okay? All right. So let's see. So um, last time uh, we were talking about uh, this idea of the very important idea of the difference between uh, pure and mixed states. And the, one way to think about it is that a pure state is called pure because it's the most possible, it's pure. It's, it's when we have absolutely the maximum information we can about a quantum system, the way we would describe that system is by a pure state. Now, of course, what's true about quantum systems is that even when we have maximum possible information about them, it doesn't mean that every measurement outcome is deterministic. There's still randomness in the measurement outcome. And that's in some sense what is odd about quantum systems, is that even when you have the maximum knowledge about a system that you could possibly have, still you can't make definite predictions about what's going to happen. Okay? Now, of course, in the world, there's other kinds of randomness that we know about, where we have incomplete information. There's information to be had, we just don't got it. And in that situation, we describe uh, the, sy the system by a mixed state. So a mixed state, one way of thinking about a, a mixed state is that we have some ensemble of possible pure states that my, a preparer might prepare for you with some probability. Okay? And the state then would be described by this density operator, which is a statistical mixture of these possible pure states that were prepared. Uh, and the pure state is in the case where we just have one and only one member of the ensemble. Okay? Um, as we've discussed, we often write the density operator in a basis, and it's important to think about it that way as well, respect to some particular basis. And in that basis, the matrix elements look like uh, these bilinear terms and probability amplitudes average over statistically average, classically average over the ensemble. Okay? Uh, and you should sort of think, and we'll come back to this a little bit later in the, in the lecture, you should sort of think about this, it's a kind of correlation function. It's a kind of correlating the two amplitudes, C alpha and C beta, in the same way that we discussed in the first week of lecture, the classical interferometer correlated the wave amplitudes say at two different times in say a Mach Zender interferometer. And maybe there was a statistical averaging because of the randomness of the phase that we didn't know coming out of the source. Okay, we'll come back to that. So you keep that in mind. It's not, of course, if it's the same amplitude, this is alpha, if beta equals alpha, then this is the square of the amplitude, which is the probability. And that's like, in this case, these coefficients would be like the intensity. All right. Um, in the case, oh yeah, so of course we have, we can sort of abstractify all of that and to say that the density operator is a mathematical quantity. It has certain properties. Its properties is a Hermitian matrix. It's a positive semi-definite matrix, which is to say that all of its diagonal matrix elements are non-negative. And those diagonal matrix elements are the probabilities to find that outcome. Okay? Um, we typically normalize it, sum these probabilities to one, and 
an expectation value would be obtained of some operators obtained by taking the trace of the product of the state with that operator. Okay, and that's the way it works. Since it's a Hermitian operator, it can be diagonalized and it has some eigen decomposition with eigenvalues and eigenvectors. This is, these are the eigenvectors of the density operator. And this is, looks like this. So it is an example of an ensemble decomposition. We can think about the density operator as a statistical mixture of its eigenvectors weighted by its eigenvalues. All of those eigenvalues are between 0 and 1, as they must be if it's normalized as a positive matrix. Right? What we're, you're studying in your homework right now, and what we'll discuss later, if you would like, is that the ensemble decomposition is not unique. It's a little bit odd the way it works in the sense that I can, the sort of the quantum probabilities and the classical probabilities kind of get mixed up together in some odd way such that I can send you different, I can prepare for you different sets of pure states with different probabilities, send them to you, and the statistics of your measurement outcomes would be exactly the same as some other. So there are equivalent sets of ensemble decompositions, which we would say make the same state. Okay? So, of course, there's, only, there's a unique one where the members of the ensemble are orthogonal they are the ones. Well, that's not quite true. So it depends on the to some unitaries. Never mind. Come back to that. Scratch that. All right. Um, right. And the other thing that we discussed, of course, is this idea that we can uh, have a kind of litmus test. If I'm just giving you, if I've given you a density operator, and it's not written in one of these forms, it's just some operator, some matrix. You can test to see whether it represents a pure state or a mixed state by, and the degree of mixedness or the degree of purity by calculating the trace of the square of the operator, and that is given by the sums of the squares of the problem of the eigenvalues. It's one way of calculating that purity, and that is a number that if the density operator is normalized, will always be between 1 and 1 over the dimension of the Hilbert space. So when, if it's maximally mixed, that's to say it's an equal mixture, statistical mixture of all orthogonal states, then its purity is 1 over d. And if it's a pure state, then its purity is 1. Okay. For the particular case of the two-level system, uh, then we said we showed how the density operator had a particularly simple form can be expressed in t as any operator can on a two-level system as some amount of identity and some amount of the Pauli matrices. In particular, it has this form, where the amount of Paulis is just the block vector. Uh, which is the expected value of the vector of Pauli matrices, sigma x, sigma y, and sigma z. And this vector uh, is a vector whose magnitude can be anywhere between 0 and 1. For a completely mixed state, statistical mixture of spin up and spin down along any direction, that block vector has, is the null vector. That's the case, this is the completely mixed state, right? First spin one half system. And when the magnitude is one, this is a unit vector. And when that's a unit vector, then this is another way of writing the projector onto spin up associated with that direction. Okay? And everything in between is some degree of mixedness. And the 
side, the, the length of that vector, everything on a sphere of a, length, of a certain length has a certain amount of purity. And that purity, as you saw, is just related to the square of the magnitude of the block vector. Okay? Um, so every state in a two-dimensional Hilbert space, pure or mixed, is inside the block ball. Often this is called the block sphere, but it really should be called the block ball. The sphere is the surface. The ball is everything, in, including the surface. So uh, all states, all the pure states lie on this block sphere, on the surface of the sphere. And that is to say, and there are no other, every point on the block sphere is a pure state, representing spin up along that direction. And every state inside the block ball is a, a, a possible mixed state, corresponding to certain, has some eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and it could be some state. All right. Any questions about any of that? All right. Um, one last thing I think I want to say about this that we didn't get to yet last time is just I mean, when we're talking about writing states in terms of density operators, um, how do we write the time dependent Schrodinger equation? So if I will have the state at time t equals zero, and I want to find the state at a later time, and I have the Hamiltonian, how do I find the state at a later time? So uh, Anyone have any ideas? You want the operator with the yeah. yeah, so I, if I had the time evolution operator, I could do that. So, I mean, of course, so this itself, say for example, in some, if I wrote it in some ensemble decomposition, I could write it like that. And this, is equal to u of t row 0 u dagger t. Right? Notice it's, if you remember the Heisenberg picture, it's the opposite. In the Heisenberg picture, the operators evolve as u dagger a u. This is the state. So this is the Schrodinger picture. This is not the Heisenberg picture. This is the Schrodinger picture. The state is evolving in time, not the observable. But it has this form. Okay. Now, we could write this, if we like, <coughs> as a differential equation, remembering that the time evolution is generated by the Hamiltonian. And this could be a time dependent Hamiltonian if I like it. Does it doesn't make a difference. I'll just leave it as a time independent Hamiltonian, but it doesn't matter. Right? That's the that's how the time evolution operator is generated. It's generated by the Hamiltonian. Right? So Given that, I can look at how the density operator evolves as a function of time. That's the u dt rho 0 u dagger of t plus u of t rho e dagger dt, right? And this is equal to this. And this is equal to the dagger of that. So this is equal to minus i over h bar h u rho u 
that anchor. The dagger of that is plus I H bar. No, that is here. Plus I H bar. You dagger and H is omission, so I don't have to dagger it. Okay, that's this is this. So you can add going to this equation. So what you notice here, of course, this is rho of t. And you know, that's rho of t again. And so what we get is d by dt rho of t is equal to minus i over h bar, the commutator of h with rho. This is the time dependent term of equation. And its solution, of course, is that we just went the other way around. Right? Again, don't confuse this with the Heisenberg picture. This is the Schrodinger picture. The state is evolving according to time, not the operator. But it has a similar form in the Heisenberg picture. Uh, so what we, what we call the Heisenberg equation of motion. If I have an observable that evolves according to time, then it goes the other way around. This is u dagger a u. And the Heisenberg equation of motion just has the commutator in the other order. Okay. Just keep that in mind. All right, so what we also discussed last lecture was we, we just briefly mentioned the idea that um, although we discussed the idea of a mixed state motivated first by the idea of a preparer who sends to you a pure state but doesn't tell you which one she's going to send you. She only tells you with what probability she's going to do so. That's not the only context in which we need to really consider the notion of a mixed state. That we have mixed states naturally occurring, in fact most of the states, most of the systems we deal with in the real world are not described by pure quantum states. They are described as mixed states because we have incomplete information about that quantum system. Because typically the environment will carry away information about the quantum system. Let's say the other degrees of freedom in which our quantum system, with which our quantum system interacts, carry away information. And that act of carrying away information acts to decohere, remove the coherences in the system, and take a pure state to a mixed state. We're going to study that dynamical process in much more detail at the latter part of the semester. But to get started on that, we're going to start just thinking about a kind of phenomenological picture. Same, let me just say the following. This description of how the state evolves that we just discussed, according to the Schrodinger equation, this description is unitary. Right? There it is. 
the anti evolution is unitary. And one of the things that's true about unitary evolution is that it is reversible. That is to say, if I have the state at time t, I could go backwards and deduce what was the state at time t equals zero. That's obvious. I can just invert this equation and say that this initial state is just the inverse Right? Take it backwards in time. Because u of minus t is u dagger of t. And if I plug that in, I get rho zero. So if I have rho and t, I can find rho and zero. It's reversible. Now, we know that most phenomena that we observe in everyday nature are not reversible. But the Schrodinger equation is reversible. Now, that's not a unique feature of quantum mechanics, right? In classical dynamics as well, we know that the Hamilton equations of motion Newton's laws, or their generalizations, are reversible. If I know that you, where the point particle is at some point, I can reverse all of its momenta and get back to where it was. I can take completely reverse. Okay? I mean, there's issues of chaos and how much information it takes to do that reversing. But in principle, if I had enough bits or enough information about about it, I can completely reverse it. Nonetheless, we know, you know, there it is, it's irreversible, and it's not going to all of a sudden come back in, the chalk's not going to come back into my hand. You can watch a movie, and you can tell whether it's running backwards or time and forwards in time. There is a time reversal breaking symmetry that happens somehow in the world. And I'm getting older, so are you, and it's not going the other way. Uh, um, unless I'm at your body. So, so th this, of course, is a deep problem, a problem that uh, is somehow, you know, how irreversible behavior emerges from microscopic description, which is fundamentally reversible, is a tough question when we still grapple with the question of the arrow of time and where does it come from. And does that have to do with black holes? I don't know. Uh, maybe, yeah. Um, so we said that the microscopic, in the microscopic level, yeah. it is reversible. Uh, my question was that if you start in a particular state, it seems like I can start in different initial states and still end up in the same final state. No, That's I not can't. That not, not if it's unitary. Okay. Uh, it's a one-to-one -one mapping. Okay. Absolutely. Now, if it's reversible, irreversible, of course, what you say is true. I can go to a steady state where many, many different initial conditions all relax to the same final state. And then I've lost information about what the initial condition was. So in a, in a unitary or a Hamiltonian system, you, you, you cannot converge onto the same state. You need dissipation to do that. So, how dissipation arises in, in, and how we treat it as some effective theory, as I say, is a deep and challenging problem. And one we will scratch the surface on a little bit later in the semester. But it becomes even more interesting in quantum mechanics because in classical dynamics, when we have, say, we have a damp simple harmonic oscillator, we think about, OK, I start with some initial mass, I pull it, I give it a ball-peen hammer, and it goes, and it damps, right? But then the energy decays, and energy goes into friction and heat in some way. But what is true in the quantum world is that there's something 
in some sense, deeper about the role of irreversibility in that it has this property of removing coherences, as we discussed a little bit last semester, I mean, last lecture, uh, in, for, in the example of thinking about collisions of our, our atom or our particle that has some superposition and the f in random phases that might be imparted on it from the surrounding molecules. Okay? And that can have the effect of reduce, removing the coherences between those two alternatives even well before any energy Okay, we're going to come to that as well. So why this is, it's somehow tied into the measurement problem, that somehow we go from something that was a coherence through position to something which is now this or that in a more classical sense of alternatives than in the quantum superposition sense. So it's an important, really important problem. And quantum optics, like everything in quantum mechanics, has been the forum in which these fundamental ideas have really first been put to the test. But today what we're going to do is talk about this in a phenomenological way. We're just in the same way that when we write down the damp simple harmonic oscillator, we put in a friction coefficient without talking about the microscopics of you know, where is the friction in the spring coming from? You know, why is, is there air pressure? What's happening? Why is this irreversible? We just put in a damping constant. We're going to do the same thing in the quantum mechanics and try to understand the degree to which we're doing this fairly. All right? So let's, how are we going to do that? Well, let's start with our two-level system. That's where we've been for the last few lectures, where we will continue to be for another few more lectures, then we'll get to the three-level system, and then infinity, and then we're done. Um, right. So, so we have our two-level system. And one of the ways that we describe the time evolution is by the block equations. As we discussed, there are many different equivalent representations of the same physics. One way we could just look at the dynamics of a block vector on a block sphere. That's one way we could write it. And then we wrote, so the block equations had the following form. du dt was minus delta v minus omega w dv dt is, oh no, this doesn't couple to the w, sorry, this does minus omega w is omega v. Okay. So these were the block equations, the equations of motion for u, v, and w, which are the components of the block vector. And as we said, an arbitrary state could be pure or mixed, could have a block vector. Right? This is, so we have a two-level system driven with uh, Rabi frequency omega and detuning. Now, this equation is actually the same thing as this equation, right? Because I can always, this is, these, these u, v, and w are just related to components of the density matrix, right? Let's try that just for fun. How is that? So what is this? Sigma x, let's remind ourselves of that. u is equal to the trace of sigma x, which is sigma plus plus sigma minus uh, with rho, right? But sigma plus 
is the thing that takes down to up, and this is the thing that takes up to down. So this is equal to uh, rho down up plus rho up down. Right? Remember for the trace. And this is just twice the real part of that. Similarly, this is twice the imaginary part of that. If you go through the same exercise with sigma y, and w is this, the difference between these diagonal elements. Okay. So again, you should think about u and v are about, so they're about the coherences with respect to the standard basis. They tell me whether there is a coherence or a position of up and down. Okay? And the U is the real part of that coherence, and the V is the imaginary part, the factor of two. And the W is about the population difference between being spin up and spin down. So if I were to write, you know, with my Hamiltonian being as we've written it for the driven two-level system in terms of, say, this is the two-level Hamiltonian. If I took the commutator of rho with this, I would get these same equations. They're one and the same. Just another way of representing the same thing. All right, now this is reversible because it's just what we just said. It's, it's the unitary evolution that's generated by the Hamiltonian. These are just, it, it, it's just one way of writing that, representing the precession of the block sphere around the torque vector by the generalized Rabi frequency, right? So now what I'm going to do is just by hand, put in damping coefficients. Assume that there is some exponential damping, like a damped harmonic oscillator. These, this is an oscillator which is damped. Now, there's traditionally, it comes, goes back to I mean, probably Bloch himself, uh, that there are sort of two phenomenological decay constants. Remember, we have the Bloch sphere here. Right, so this has been up and this has been down, say, along the Z. So the W component is representing the, the relative weight of this versus that. And the degree to which this just sort of decays from spin up to spin down, that decay rate, that pop, the rate at which population decays, what's called T1, the time, the time scale, it's called T1. So we call, so there's some decay at, with a time scale T1, this is the rate of decay, so that this thing decays exponentially. Now, it may not decay to zero, it might decay down, so we could put in some steady state. This is the steady, whatever the steady state value is. So if there was no driving, this thing would just decay to its steady state value, right? That kind of people spin it. So T1 is, is that type of Now on the other hand, if I start with a, a block vector, a state along, say, I don't know, the uh, some direction here, the x direction, it might be the case that I don't decay up or down, but I lose my coherence. I become a statistical mixture of up and down. 
So in that case, I would go inside the block sphere and I would lose my coherence, but not polarize. That kind of process whereby I lose coherence was called T2. So I could put in a T2 decay here for V and a T2 for U. And they would typically decay to zero. So there's no steady state there. These equations are known as the block equation. Really with the decay, this is what block down. These are the block equations, including the non-logical decay. By the way, so so let's just write that down. especially in some older literature, this is sometimes called T parallel and T perpendicular in the sense of the block. If it's a true spin, you define a quantization axis by a big magnetic field. The decay of the spin along that is parallel to that field, and the decay of the spin is perpendicular to that in this physical box here. We don't use those terms very much anymore, but you'll see it sometimes. All right. Um, very good. So what would that mean? So what if I had, the, what, if, what if the, I mean, we could try to solve these equations. There are solutions, and they're called Victoria the solutions. We rarely use them full solutions to the, these equations. We often do it in certain approximate cases. Uh, but just in terms of some um, intuition about what's going on, let's, let's look at the following. Let's say look, I have the blocks here. Well, let's just look at it in cross-section. Right? So um, if I'm in the rotating frame, and I, so I start, say, spin down. And let's say that my, I'm on resonance to start. OK? So my torque vector, say, is uh, out of, or say, in the x direction. OK? Well, if there was no damping, this thing would just Robbie oscillate, right? You spin down, to spin up. Spin up along y over here. Spin down along y over here, etc. Right? We just rob the oscillator. What's going to happen? So in that case, I, I've set the tuning to zero. This doesn't make sense. sense. Uh, so in the absence of damping, you know, and at zero tuning, the U coefficient is always zero, the V and W, you go back and forth. The v, v component is the Y component, and the W is the Z component. So it stays in, the, in that plane, right? And what's going to happen when I put on the damping? Well, firstly, it's going to reach some state. state. It's not going to keep oscillating forever. It's going to reach a steady state in the same way this damp harmonic oscillator does. And the amount, whatever value reaches, depends on the relative strength of, say, the damping rates to omega. Right? Uh, 
So in this case, what we know, of course, is that if I look at, say, the probability to be, say, spin up along z as a function of time, we have the situation where we a little bit better. Robbie oscillate, right? Now, what happens if I have damping in this situation? Well, firstly, it's not going to stay a pure state. Why? Because, well, these amplics going to amplitude are going to decay. So this block vector is going to move inside the block sphere. More, so it depends if it's an overdamped or an underdamped oscillator. Of course, that depends on how big the damping is compared to the natural resonance frequencies. But this thing is going to do some kind of spiral. In. It's going to end with no coherences. In steady state, the coherences will decay. That's not quite true. That's not quite true because it's, it's being tricked. It's going to have some, some amount. So it's going to get somewhere. It's going to go to some point here. With some amount of coherence and some amount of spin up versus spin down. But there's a fixed point here, a steady state. Okay? The block vector is there. Now, of course, this is in the rotating frame. In the lab frame, this thing is processing around the z-axis, right, at the natural frequency, omega naught. So what does that mean in terms of the probability to be up versus down in this problem? Well, it too, what's going to happen in this case, you know, there's some steady state value, which is the amount of the, the z, how much up versus how much down. Something a little bit less than a half, depending on in this how I do, do it in this case. And I'm going to get something that looks kind of like that. And this is what's known as damped Robbie oscillations, or damped Robbie block. We can solve, as we will, next lecture probably, what this steady state value is and how it depends on these parameters in the problem. But a few points to note is that this is now, whereas this was reversible, this is irreversible. I don't know, there's many different initial states that all go to the same steady state. Steady state, by definition, is independent of the initial state. There is some fixed point of these dynamics. Um, and moreover, the state is mixed in steady state. It's not necessarily the completely mixed state, which is sitting right here, right? It has some amount of up versus down, and it has some amount of coherence as well. Come back to that a little bit as well. All right. So, yeah. Um, because there's some amount of coherence left over in the block equations, do you need to include the steady state uh, u and v or no? No, that is, that is the steady state that is induced by the driving. So if the driving were zero, the steady state would be zero. So it's, whereas here, I could have a situation that even in the absence of driving, there is a steady state imbalance of up versus down. For example, if this were a two-level atom, as we've discussed, and this is the excited state, and this is the ground state, what's the steady state if I have no driving at all? So I put an atom in the excited state, or some superposition of excited in the ground. 
what will happen ultimately? It'll go to the ground state, right? If there's k, okay. and so the steady state vector is that it's actually a pure state in that case, and it's the ground state. It has no coherence relative to this standard based on up and down, but it does have the steady state of W is minus one rather than the completely mixed state of equal amounts. So that steady state is what is the steady state in the absence of driving. What this would correspond to, and we'll talk about this a little bit more next lecture, in the context of the two-level atom, if this were, say, E and G, is that there is some induced dipole moment. Right? Because the dipole, the electric dipole moment of the atom depends on the coherence between E and G. And because I'm driving the system in steady state, it has, I've induced a dipole moment. And that oscillating dipole moment is represented by this processing box here. But if I had no drive, the dipole would decay to zero and it would be in the ground state. Thanks for the question. All right. So what can we say a little bit more about these uh, T1 and T2 times? Um, right. So, um, right. So let's consider. Let's consider the kind of ensemble decomposition that we wrote down before. Some statistical mixture of pure states, which we wrote also uh, in terms of the matrix elements. Now these are evolving as a function of time. Now let's suppose there's no dynamics on the system, no Hamiltonian, there's only the dissipation in the system. So the coherences decay by T2 and the populations decay by T1. Alright? Now Let's look at some population in some state. This is this, average over the ensemble, right? This is going to decay generally. Generally, the population in some state doesn't stay there forever. So there's some decay rate. This is phenomenologically what would happen in the absence of any other Hamiltonian. The population will generally decay out of that, some, some excitement. So if that happens, what can we say about the amplitude? Well, what we could say then is the following.
will be related to whatever rates of population there are for the two states. But what about T2? Well, let's take a look at this a little bit more carefully. So let's write this guy as the magnitude of that times the phase. And similarly for this. So loosely speaking, we would say that each of these guys decays because the amplitudes decay, the magnitude squared decays by this. So that means the absolute value of this, take the square root, would decay as gamma over 2. So this would be equal to e to the minus uh, gamma alpha over 2 plus gamma beta over 2. times the sum okay. and some kind of average of the phase difference that's happening. In other words, there are different processes which can lead to decay of the coherences. One is that population out of this, these states decays. If population decays, it might go back here, or it might go to some other states, if I have more than one state. If population decays, if we actually get the, the particle to go from one state to another, that has effect on the decay of the coherences. But there's another way, a way we already described, in which you can get decay of coherence, which is that we don't actually get population to go from one to another, but we just give a little phase shift by an energy change between those two states. And if that phase shift is random, well, that will tend to average out to zero, which will make these orthogonal elements decay to zero. So one physical mechanism we already discussed by which decoherence can happen is dephasing due to elastic collisions. So there could be another term here, this thing, as we discussed when we, in our phase diffusion model. This should be times t, by the way. T, was that there would, there would be some decay here with some constant beta. This is that time t zero. So the bottom line of this is the following. We have in this phenomenological model that this thing decays means that 1 over t2 is equal to, in this case, 2 over t1 plus some other, for example, collisions. So what is the moral of this story? The moral of the story is that typically, in almost every system, the T2 time is way shorter than the T1 time. Because coherences are much more fragile 
than populations. Any perturbation of the energy of the system without actually driving population from one to another will act to decohere the coherences without changing the populations. Okay? On the other hand, even if I got rid of all of those slight dephasings, if there's any kind of decay of population at all, that will contribute to the decay of coherences. Both things decay, kind of, kind of contribute to the decay of coherences. Okay. All right. Very good. Now, one of the things that we discussed in homework, that you saw in homework, was there can be another way that, for example, the Rabi oscillations can decay. There is another other processes that are, in some sense, different from this that can take what were coherent oscillations and make them decay. Another process we can have what's called inhomogeneous dephasing. What's, what's the deal with that? Well, what we studied in homework is the situation in which, for example, this torque vector, we have an ensemble of different particles, each of which is experiencing a different magnitude of the torque vector. In which case, you would have many different Rabi oscillations that are at different frequencies. And when you add them up, eventually they get in phase with one another. And so you would see for example, some kind of a situation like that where you might see something like this, where this envelope of decay is coming from the fact that I have an ensemble of different omega. Yeah? Could you pick your probability distribution in a way that it doesn't necessarily decay? Um, you can certainly have situations where that are commensurate, where there might be sort of some collapses and revivals, depending on, typically, one doesn't pick one probability distribution, one just happens. But could there be a situation where that kind of thing happens? And the answer is yes, you could. You could have a situation where, you know, there's some inter there's some commensurate relationship of rationals that makes things revive at certain times. But that would be a kind of freakish thing. But the point that I wanted to uh, make here, and one that you saw in your homework last time, is this kind of decay is not really decay at all. In the sense that every member of the ensemble is undergoing unitary evolution. No information left the system. It's all there, which meant that you could recover it, right, by the, the spin echo technique that you studied in your homework. You could make this such that at a later time, this revives. You could reverse this. So inhomogeneous dephasing is reversible. It's not really decoherence. It's dephasing. All right? And one talks, the time scale over which that happens, one talks about a T2 star. So you'll hear that jargon. Now, it's gotten a little bit confused, what people call T2 star versus T2. Really, what we would say is the following. I mean, the, the traditional literature would define the following. So I would define T2 star 
is the time scale to decay solely due to inhomogeneity. Okay. One used to call, and you barely see this notation, T2 prime as the time scale to decay due to homogeneous effects. So every particle in the ensemble decays in exactly the same way due to some homogeneous effect by collisions, which are statistically the same for all member, or spontaneous emission. And one would call T2, 1 over T2, the total rate of decay as 1 over T2 prime plus 1 over T2 star. That's really how it should be. But you know, people usually call T2 star the whole thing now, not just the homogeneous, inhomogeneous part. All right. So now, let's suppose I want to measure the amount of coherence that there is in my two-level system. I've created some superposition, and now my superposition can decohere. Or maybe I didn't make my superposition so perfectly. And I want to measure the coherence. How do we measure Populations, we do that by uh, measuring what, having some kind of something like a Stringer-Gerlach apparatus, which asks you, are you in that state or that? And if it comes out in one spot in the beam versus another, tell me whether it's that or that. But how do you measure coherences? Well, the way you always measure coherences is via interference. That's what it means to talk about coherence. And the way in which we measure coherences uh, in a system, a two-level system, is with some kind of two-path interferometer. in the homework, that two-path interferometer for any two-level system is the Ramsey interferometer. So, how does that work? Let's review it. We've had it, you've had it in homework, you have it again, you have it again and again. What is the point? Well, the idea here is the following. Um, it's best understood thinking about this on the block sphere. Okay? So let's say I, I want to create an equal superposition of up and down. And I want to know how good is the coherence that I've made of that equal superposition? Well, one way to do it is to start the system, say, spin 
down along uh, the Z direction. And then apply a pulse that is so hard, so if there's such a strong amplitude, it doesn't care about it in the, in the homogeneities, it does the same thing for all pulses, and puts the system into a coherent superposition of up and down. Okay? So let's say he tries to do that. So here it is, say, uh, I, I've put it in this, in this superposition along here. Now what's going to happen? Well, if there was no decoherence, what would happen to this block thing? It'll process around the z-axis. In the lab frame, it processes at the free resonance frequency omega naught. In the rotating frame, which is defined relative to the oscillator that I use to drive this pi over 2 pulse, this thing is processing at the frequency of the detuning, right? So this thing processes at the detuning in the rotating frame. So this is what you saw in your last homework assignment, right? Your last homework assignment, the idea of how do you measure, I want to measure precisely what is the rotation frequency of this oscillator, omega naught. What you do is you first put it into the x, y plane, and then you leave it there as long as you can. And you want to see whether your oscillator stays exactly in phase with this oscillator. If they're not exactly in phase, over a long time, they will eventually start to get out of phase. And the more, the more time you can just leave it processing, you're basically checking your clock versus this clock. If you're staying in phase with it, then the next time around, when you rotate another pi over 2, you put it all the way up here. On the other hand, if this thing processed a little bit, delta t, then it will get up here. And the, the longer time you have, the more you can see the difference between your oscillator and the natural oscillator. That's how an atomic clock works. You're basically syncing your local oscillator to the atom, which is the reference. Okay. All right, so let's come back to this problem. There's a number of ways we can describe this. Um, let me look at the following case first. Yeah. Okay, so let's say I want, here's one way I do. Suppose I want to, I want to measure the coherence time. How long does this thing stay a coherent superposition up and down, rather than decaying in towards zero, right, as it loses coherence? I want to measure that. How can I do it? Well, one way to think about doing that is by looking at the visibility of the Ramsey fringe. Okay. Remember what we looked at in the first week of the semester. The visibility of the fringes told us whether there was coherent superposition of the two waves that were, in, that were going through the interferometer. So we want to try to use that exact analogy to talk about these Ramsey fringes. What are those Ramsey fringes? Well, here's one way to do it. So here's what my 
let's say I had, let, let, let's use the analogy with our mock sensor interferometer. So, I have my mock sensor interferometer, and I have some phase shape. Okay. Let's suppose that um, the light that I see in this print as a function of phi, what would I expect to see if I had coherent versus incoherent light? Well, if it's completely incoherent, let me do it this way, then half of the light would come out here and have to go out there, it wouldn't make a difference. Right? But if it's perfectly coherent, I would see this thing oscillate up and down like that. And if it's anywhere in between, I'd see some visibility of the fringe. So this is perfect coherence. This is max in incoherent, and this is partially coherent. Okay. Now, I could do exactly the same thing here using a Ramsey interferometer, where the role of the beam splitters is a pi over 2 pulse. That's the thing that it takes one state and it takes into superposition of two states. And the phase shifter, well, that depends on the phase of the torque vector. That's to say, the angle of the torque vector. As I change the phase of the drive, as you remember, that determines the phase, the angle, on the block sphere over which the torque is occurring, right? So let's think about the following sequence. So I have the Ram a Ramsey sequence. What I do is some pulse, that's a pi over 2 pulse, around x. It's got many more oscillations than what I showed you because it's, you know, it's quasi monochromatic. And then I leave this alone for a while. If I want to. Or, no, I don't even have to do that in this case. So this is around. Well, yeah, I'm going to do that for some time, too. And then I'm going to have another pulse, which is phase shifted by this by some amount of phi. As you can see, this guy starts here, and this guy has a slightly different phase. See what I mean by the phase? It's where this guy started. Here, this guy is phase shifted relative to this. Is that clear? I didn't draw it very well. But I think you understand what you know, maybe you can ask me a question. So, um, what does that correspond to on the block sphere? Well, the first pulse does this. This is now a long spin up along the line. Right? And then I let it sit for a time t. Well, it's going to decay. The off diagonal matrix elements and the diagonal matrix elements will decay, but let's just Let's just talk about, let's just say we're looking at the off-diagonal part right now. Okay. 
we ought that the coherences will decay at rate T2, and this will go inside here. So I had a torque, which was the original guy, and then I let it, and this guy goes inside here. Yeah? Won't it also rotate at the same time? This is in the rotating frame. We always, always look at this in the rotating frame unless we say otherwise. Are we on resonance? Good question. Good question. Yes. Otherwise, you're right. It would process. So let's just say at don't equal zero. Thank you, Paul. That is very important. Otherwise, you're right. It would it would process at the detuning. Okay. So in the rotating frame, our resonance system just will just decay. Now I have a second pi with two poles which is at some phase relative to the first one, which corresponds to torquing it around a slightly different vector by an angle phi relative that is determined by exactly that phase. So now it will go up here somewhere. Okay. Now, you have a homework problem to calculate what the probability is to find the guy spin up after time t as a function of this phase. And the answer is this. That's right. So there's another way that we can make this interferometer, which is instead of having the equal arms and putting a phase shifter here, I could move this path relative to the other. And think about two different times which is another way of putting the two beams out of phase. Now, in the context of the Ramsey interferometer, what that would correspond to is the following. These mirrors over here, as we discussed, is in the middle here, I put another pulse. which is a pi rotation. And then I have a TA and a TB. So this is like a two-arm interferometer. The first arm of the interferometer has a path TA. The second arm of the interferometer has a path TB. If they're exactly equal, then this is the spin echo sequence. If they're unequal, well, then I'm not going to have a perfect echo, right? And that, well, that unequal echo will only be true. I mean, this will be, this, I would have to do this off resonance to see that. I would say typically, when one is trying to measure coherences in these kind of problems, the way I understand it, you typically wouldn't do it right on the resonance. Because then your apparatus is very sensitive to being exactly on resonance. You want to have some, allow a little bit of flexibility that your apparatus isn't exactly on resonance. So you would measure it this way. In some sense, it's like a white light interferometer. A white light interferometer is one that, when it's in perfect balance, it doesn't matter what the color is. It always sees perfect. 
So we're going to discuss this as part of your homework as well. We'll discuss this during the problem session. The thing about this kind of sequence is that, firstly, by having this pi over 2, pi, pi over 2, this Spinaco sequence, we can remove any inhomogeneous broadening and measure solely the decoherence having to do with the homogeneous broadening. And this would be done in resonance. All right, we'll talk about all of that during the problem session with whatever questions you have. All right, let's uh, take a little break and we'll reconvene at 2 o'clock.